How are you? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> How are you? We just had this massive, massive talk already. I feel pretty <laughs> wasted. I feel too wasted to do yeah. this. I'm mean, like, I, I feel like we have dived right into the Cappadocian Fathers and if you know, Cla Cap Cappadocian Fathers influencing classical theism. Oh my goodness. Do your Verdi and Anselmi and, and Aquinas and Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to do at some point, just just if anyone's listening and they care, you know, at some point we have to come back and do justice to that topic. We have to at least, I think what I'd like to do is get a Dury Virian on and a, and a, like a scholastic guy on and get him talking and, you know, that would be amazing. But, and that's um, us. oh, true that. Yeah, we have all the resources <laughs> within ourselves and I was failing to see that, forgive me. But uh, wow, no, I realize it's it's a big topic, and obviously it's quite a hot topic now. And the the whole thing is, uh, you know, it's it's hit a bit of a, um, I suppose it's hit a lot of controversy. And um, Dalazel's book has been important like that. Uh, so let's just leave that all out. I think just to kind of make sure we get through uh, what this is about, which is thankfully nothing to do with any <laughs> any theism at all. It's more to do with uh, kind of allegory and stuff. Uh, so again, if you're just uh, tuning into this, uh, we are basically going through these texts, uh, working our way through church history, just getting little snippets of the classics, just stuff you kind of have to read at some point. And, uh, and The Life of Moses by Gregory Evans is what we're looking at here. And um, what, what I would suggest, uh, where did you get yours? So it wasn't in the shafe. Uh, okay. It wasn't in the collection edition. Shaf it's only been recently translated into English. So I just put in Gregory of Nyssa, Life of Moses PDF. And it came up? Boom. Okay, nice. And that's the one with the nice forward as well? It's the one with the excellent forward. So uh, it's a bunch of Catholic scholars, Paulinist Press. And man, talk about an in-depth analysis. Mm. So helpful. Beautiful. Yeah. Now, if I, if I loved people enough, I would link that to the show notes, but... I don't, so I'm not. So you're just going to have to use your little fingers and type Google, you know, Google, get me Gregory of Nyssa and, oh, Nyssa, sorry, Nick, Gregory of Nyssa. And, um, and then you will find something, even though they don't have the Philip Schaff version. Yes. All right. I know. Good. Now, um, what do we know about this guy? I mean, you read through that forward? Yeah, I'm just trying to recall the details. He's he the younger brother. Was I remember identifying because you get Basil, right? And you, Basil's like the older brother and he bullied, uh, I just always remember, he bullied Gregory into his uh, bishopric or whatever it was uh, and um, uh, in, in Nyssa, right? And basically, um, you know, I just think of my brother and I, and I just think, <laughs> yeah, sounds about right, you know? So he bullied you? No, no, the other way around. Just like Gregory and uh -huh. just like just like uh, Basil. I'm Basil, he's Gregory. Except that the way it flips around is like, I'm also the great thinker. So I'm also the younger <laughs> brother. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. So I don't leave <laughs> anything to my brother at all. <laughs> no, just kidding. But um, basically, uh, so Gregory was the thinker of the two, uh, of the three. There was a third one. Who was the third one again? Um, there was a sister. The sister, that's right. Yeah. Who was well known for her piety. <laughs> Right, right, right. She did write a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. So, like, the whole family was super influential. And uh, Basil didn't actually have a lot of respect for his younger brother. His younger brother hadn't gone through the traditional schools and channels oh, of training. So, he had a lot of liberty and freeness in his expression. Yeah. And that made him very original in his thinking. Yeah. And it, apparently, he was just a better thinker as well. So, you know, yeah. he, was, he was the guy. Anyway, so Life of Moses was one of his greatest works, um, or at least, sorry, latest. I shouldn't say greatest, more like latest. Um, I mean, because obviously their big role was the Trinity and, you know, establishing the Aryan, uh, at least uh, killing off the Aryan and establishing the Athanasian Orthodoxy. Um, yeah. we, we were just talking about essence and energies there and the way that that related to uh, God's being and personhood. And, and so, yeah. He was a champion of the divinity of the spirit. Okay, nice. And he was one of the key guys who wrote against uh, Apollinarius. Right. Apollinarius of Laodicea. So Apollinarianism yeah. is where uh, the divine word inhabits the human nature, like not demon possession, but divine possession. Right. So it's 100% human, but <clears throat> like the spirit part's divine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't realize this, but in my readings, I, um, 
Apollinaris taught that not only did the divine word inhabit the human nature of Christ, like a divine possession, mm -hmm. but that Jesus brought his human body with him from heaven, the heavenly flesh of the Anabaptists. Mm. Mm. So um, <clears throat> Nyssa wrote, wrote against that as well. Okay, there we go. So big, big um, on all those kinds of aspects, theism, I suppose. Uh, so super orthodox theology. on that, but yeah. uh, not orthodox on apocatastasis. Right. Yeah. And even just uh, on that point, just that kind of negative uh, theology, you know, that we want to um, just always link to the Eastern Fathers, I suppose. But um, what, 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 um, what would you reject? And then the origin thing. Let's not forget to talk about the connection there. I suppose we will. Well, the uh, apocatastasis is the view of universalism that everyone's going to ultimately get saved. Mm. Which like is the origin. same view that yeah. Been taught. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he had that. He was definitely an origin type scholar. Yeah. So very like origin, like Clement of Alexandria, uh, very influenced by Neoplatonism. And some have even made a positive comparison, just showing the relationship between him and the works of Philo. Mm -hmm. and Philo was a Jew mm. who was writing to defend the barbarian religion of the Jews mm -hmm. to the sophisticated thinking of Greek philosophy and using Neoplatonism as a way to bridge the gap. And he actually wrote a letter on, uh, he wrote about the life of Moses and almost in exactly the same way. So you almost have yeah. a Christian right. version of Philo, yeah. Yeah, all very interesting. And um, you use that twofold. Uh, I wouldn't call it, it's not the fourfold allegorical me method, it was the twofold method and um it was uh or the two-stage approach and basically it amounts to just kind of uh i, I want to say you know it's allegory but there's you know well i'll say some of these comments for when we actually go through it but like a lot of the stuff as you read it through is so closely connected to what you do think is true and wow. and what is an appropriate um analogy or, or illustration and I've, you know, I've, I found myself thinking, I've heard this before through dispensational preachers, and I've heard this before through dispensational preachers, and I've heard this before. And I found myself just thinking about preachers. what's that? <laughs> I, when I was reading him, I thought, man, this sounds like the preaching I used to hear in the charismatic. Church. Well, that too. You know, you basically are taking, you're moralizing, you're, uh, but, but it's moral. even more like it's an illustration of a thing that we, we get from the New Testament somehow. You know, and, and it just fits right in there. So yes, let's read it because I think people will see. Can, it can I read as, something yeah. before we get stuck into it? Because the portions we're going to read are very short. Okay. So let me just read. This is, so this is from the introduction written by those other scholars. I don't cool. know their names. But um, so, you know, it, it's, it's got various headings. So it digs into the exegetical tradition, showing mm -hmm. how it lines up with Philo and Origen and Clement of Alexandria. Um, and then what it does is it looks at the qualities of spiritual life. And I thought this really just hits the nail on the head in terms of getting to the, the essence of, of, of what typifies this guy. Mm. So it says this, Gregory's spiritual theology has come in for great attention in recent years. The life of Moses is a particularly important formulation of his Christian spirituality. Mm -hmm. Gregory calls attention to those features of Moses' life which may be considered a withdrawal from active involvement in the affairs, in the affairs of men. Yeah. So remember, Moses leaves uh, Egypt and goes into Midian. Mm -hmm. In Midian, he lived alone in the mountains, away from the turmoil of the marketplace. Okay. Mm -hmm. And on Sinai, leaving the people behind, he boldly approached the very darkness itself. Gregory encourages the solitary life or life among those of lack disposition and mind. But there is still the return to society for service. The Moses who had known the discipline of the desert gained the hearing of the people. <clears throat> And he who had been instructed by God in the thick darkness went down to his people to share with them the marvels that he had seen. Wow. Practical philosophy must be joined to contemplate philosophy. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. <clears throat> so, yeah, there we go. There's an example of, you know, sometimes you hit it, sometimes you don't. Yeah. You know, sometimes it works with something that you are familiar with in the New Testament, and it becomes like a really amazing model for that. But yeah. sometimes you just like, dude, that's nowhere in the Bible. And actually... <sighs> You just came up with that based on this method. You know, you know what it is. It's it's you're shortcutting good biblical uh, hermeneutics. Because so instead of looking at it in terms of what it would have meant to the original audience and the original author and God's original intention in writing it, just short circuit that whole process and try and find the parity with your own situation. Yeah, exactly. Read yourself into the text, basically. Right, and sometimes you hit it, sometimes you don't, depending on how how basically <laughs> yeah. orthodox you are. Yeah. Um, all right, good. Well, that's a that's a great little intro. Um, so yeah, uh, we're gonna jump around. Uh, so what what is this book? 
two. We're looking at book two. Uh, we are in paragraph 122 and 125. And then we'll just jump uh, around And then 127 there. to 129. Yeah. 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 And then. So he's working through the life of Moses. We're now at that point where the crossing of the Red Sea takes place. And we're going to look at the spiritualizing of the crossing of the Red Sea. If you like. Yeah. Interesting. All right. You kick us off. And then um, I'll take All right. So, I mean, my, my headings are a little bit different. So uh, it sort of cuts in halfway through 121. So I'll just take it from the heading. Cool. So they, they seem to have taken it as a portion. Mm. No one who hears, who hears this should be ignorant of the mystery of the water. He who has gone down into it with the army of the en enemy emerges alone. See, leaving like, the like enemy's army good. drowning in the water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've, now, I've preached the sermon. I've preached the sermon. <laughs> this is like, I think my first sermon, basically just going, you know, hey, Look, yeah, before like, you knew hermeneutics, this is how you read the text. I know, this is it. Basically, look, they're like they're like the sinful things about you. You've got to kill them off. You know, look, the the horses drive your sin. You know, yeah. look at look how the horses are. You know, they're kind of like that drive in you, you know, <laughs> pulling you along. It's the uh, wild animal in you. Eh? Wild... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right, go yeah. for it. Okay, so one twenty-two. For who does not know that the Egyptian army? Those horses, chariots, and their drivers, archers, slingers, heavily armed soldiers, and the rest of the crowd in the enemy's line of battle are the various passions of the soul by which man is enslaved. Who doesn't know that? Who? <laughs> Who? For the undisciplined intellectual drives and the sensual impulses to pleasure, sorrow, and covetousness are indistinguishable from the aforementioned army. Indistinguishable. Reviling. <laughs> Reviling is a stone straight from the sling. And the spirited impulse is the quivering spear point. The passion mm -hmm. for pleasures is to be seen in the horses who themselves with irresistible drive pull the chariot. See, now here's the thing. You could you could say that. You could go, I mean, this would be 100% legit, I think. You would go, all right, this is what baptism means. This is what conversion <clears throat> means. This is what, you know, it means to leave your sin behind. Now, look at this text, right? Um, it's got nothing to do with any of that, right? This is basically about israel and moving through and the enemies of god yeah. enemies of god there is a connection in the enemies god of your soul his people. right but look what a great illustration it makes of 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 sin you know yeah you know if you had just said illustration it would have been fine it's like you could use you could use the new york times to pull out something or the bible it's like <laughs> that random at that point but it's kind of true that you know look there's a great way to picture the enemies of your soul you know um you could say the text doesn't teach this but this could remind us of yeah <laughs> that's a great little clause right there um but yeah exactly and that would be fine but it's like what the problem is he's saying no no this is what it is this yeah. is what it, this is what it it's intending to communicate primarily now um, in part of the introduction to this uh the pdf document here one of the things that that was highlighted was that the the jewish religion was seen as barbarian Mm -hmm. to the unsophisticated Greek philosophy. Right, right. So reading it this way was a way in which you show the word of God to be superior and not less than philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so this, this, the spiritualizing of the text was a way in which you try to dress it up to make mm -hmm. it appealing to the sophisticated mind. It worked for Augustine. Yeah. You know, that's the way he came in. Enzo pulled him in like that. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, you know, that, that's, I suppose the, it, it comes down to that, you know, that Greek hatred for, for all things, uh, you know, the four matter distinction uh, and, and basically just not, not wanting any, um, anything to be what it is, you know, it's always got to pull up to this higher form of it. And, yeah. um, and I think that's what's going on with a lot of this stuff. Um, we know, of course, they didn't like the, the, the incarnation even. And so, you know, insofar as there is analogy with, with the plain literal meaning of the word, I mean, you could see how they would run into problems there. Um, all right, so I'll kick us off with the, the next one here. Um, 125. This is 125, so we're jumping over a few uh, paragraphs. <clears throat> Moreover, the history teaches us by this what kind of people they should be who come through the water, bringing nothing of the opposing army along as they emerge from the water. For if the enemy came up out of the water with them, they would continue in slavery even after the water, since they would have brought up with themselves the tyrants still alive, whom they did not drown in the deep. <clears throat> If anyone wishes to clarify the figure, this lays it bare. Those who pass through the mystical water in baptism must put to death in the water the whole phalanx of evil, such as covetousness, unbridled desire, rapacious thinking, 
uh, the passion of conceit and arrogance, wild impulse, wrath, anger, malice, envy, and all such things. Since the passions naturally pursue our nature, we must put to death in the water both the base movements of the mind and the acts which issue from them. So, now, yeah. they're a good example of the same thing, really, I suppose, in that, you know, you're, you know, we would look at our doctrine of conversion, and, you know, this is, it's almost like Paul saying, you know, do we sin after coming to Christ that grace may abound, perish the thought, <laughs> you know, uh, no, do you not know you've been baptized with, with this whole thing? What's helpful uh, background um, knowledge here is that he did not believe in, um, uh, he did not believe you could attain to perfection in this life. Yeah. And, and he was quite he strong on that. Removed, so he didn't believe baptism removed sin. No. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you could almost conclude otherwise just r- from reading that paragraph. But I think taken in that light, he's just simply saying, you gotta, you gotta be, you gotta, and in that, you know, and that, this is where it got kind of interesting for me because, you know, amen. That that is baptism. Leave your sins behind, and also live a new life. <laughs> and also, I'm the first one to connect the Red Sea crossing with baptism, you know. Yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. and you know, in that sense, you have quite a very quite a close sort of. I mean, the enemies are drowned, and God's people come through. There is something about that that I think does carry <clears> through. <throat> it's just that it, it, you know, you have to untangle it before you can re put it together again. Yeah which makes you nervous in reading it, I suppose. Um, so I guess if we were going to read a redemptive historically, we would say that the enemy of Satan was drowned in the baptism of Christ yeah. when he was judged in his baptismal judgment on the cross. Yeah, yeah. We, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't apply it to the, because, the, you know, you've got the three enemies of Satan, uh, the enemies without and the enemy, enemies within. We'd be seeing this Pharaoh as the representative enemy. Yeah. Not talking about the enemies in our own hearts, where he's taken every enemy, including the enemy in our, of our own hearts, and aimed at its sanctification. Yeah. Although, you know, I, even there, I, I'd probably be okay with saying, well, as a result of that redemptive historical reality, um, you know, you now struggle with sin, but you struggle, you know, yeah. in the gospel, and you apply the gospel to, I mean, what is it to apply the gospel to your own sin? But to, but to remind yourself of, of the fact that, you know, Pharaoh is drowned, <laughs> essentially. And Romans 6, baptism and leaving sin behind are definitely linked. Totally. So Dead to sin. Maybe, we, yeah. maybe he's right. Maybe we, should, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe we need to go back to the, to the Cappadocian fathers. I mean, I mean that's, that's the trouble with uh, this allegorical way of reading. It's that the theology is often true. It's just never in the right place. That's right. Well, that's what's a hit and miss, you know, because we're agreeing with the baptism connection now. But what if yeah. it was something else that he was doing, like the whole Because well, we could thing. make this connection. You see, everyone should get baptized on their own. Because you because they because Israel came out of the water alone. Well, no, no, you wouldn't do that. You would say, "Is it not obvious to everyone that because <laughs> Israel, Israel's departing alone is indistinguishable from your departing alone?" You know, yeah. so yeah. So you actually baptize yourself. So John the Baptist, <laughs> wrong. John the Baptist shouldn't have baptized Jesus. Should have just been Jesus' own himself no, no. going in. You kill a horse and then you baptize yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway. On that point, I got a short right. little one next. Is yours long or short? Uh, 127, 128, 129 are all pretty short. Okay. Yeah. All right. You, you do that one. Go for it. Okay. 127. Yeah. Many of those who receive the mystical baptism in ignorance of the commandments of the law mix the bad living of the old life with the new life. Even after crossing the water, they bring along the Egyptian army, which still lives with them in their doings. Have you so never that's just the reality. The, have you yeah. never preached the sermon? Uh, you know, that you go into the land, Joshua goes into the land and conquers the Canaanites. They're the enemies of God's people. They're God's enemies, essentially. You know, and w- this is, you know, this is uh, the enemies, the ruthlessness against which he con- with which he conquered them is the same ruthlessness that we're called to conquer our enemies in. Except How about this? That cut this off your own of my, hand. This is one of my first sermons. Samson killed the Philistines. We kill the Philistines with the sword of the word. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, eh? It's good. I like it. I like it. <laughs> the sword connection. I got it. Yep. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. 
And it's, it's, it's right. I mean, like, the, this is charismatic <laughs> preaching right here. You know, this is, it's crazy how it's come through like that. But it's also true, as I was saying earlier, that dispensational preaching often goes in this direction as well. And the reason for that is they don't have the redemptive historical connection, and they've got to use their Old Testament somehow. So yeah. it ends up being, all right, well, here's a good illustration of that, and here's yeah. a good illustration of that. Illustrative materials, yeah. 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 So it's interesting reading this stuff because you see that, you know, it's almost like this is what happens one way or another when you take that unity out. You've got to connect it somehow, but you just lose the grounding, you know. Um, but as you say, there was other, there were other things going on as well with the philosophy and whatnot. But okay, let me hit us with uh, the next paragraph. So, uh, take a, a take for instance the one who became rich by robbery or injustice, or who acquired property through perjury, or or who lived with a woman in adultery, <clears throat> or who undertook any of the other things against uh, life which have been forbidden before the gift of baptism. Does he think that even after his watching, uh, at least his washing, he may continue to enjoy those evil things which have become attached to him and yet be freed from the bondage of sin as though he cannot see that he is under the yoke of harsh masters? It's good. It's good. I mean, you know, yeah, beating the same <laughs> horse, aren't we? But, yeah. but I think, you know, I suppose, you know, one thing we should say is that this is why you can read this old stuff. You know, it's, it's not like, it's not like it's valueless. You know what I mean? It's like, if you have that greater theology in play, you know, you have to be critical. You have to, you know, make sure that you're not imbibing everything that's going on. And obviously that's the thing that's going to stop you from following him into the desert and, you know, that kind of thing. But, but there is, I mean, there'll be insights, right? There'll be insights. One of my favorite commentaries is the, I forget what it's called now, but, um, the it's they're basically taking Schaff's um anti Nicene fathers and just drawing all the all the um comments on the gospels. And uh when I was preaching through the gospels, man, I just go back back to it again and again. I almost never agree with their method, but the insights of their contemplation, you know, yeah. you can almost certainly fit into your <clears throat> sermon in some way. And, the same framework of theology does yield very similar results. Yeah, 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 that's true. I guess that's the, the beauty of having uh, a framework of theology. Yeah, exactly right. It gives you a kind of sturdiness as you go through. And you, and that's why I always say, like, people are like, oh, you know, you don't want to get all detailed and, you know, just, just get the fundamentals <laughs> down and move on. But it's only when you get that framework down and, and become, you know, get confident in, in what it is that you feel is actually going on that you're able to move past it into kind of, you know, to not feel intimidated by an opposing position, but rather, you know, you know exactly where you disagree and why you disagree. So you're able to see where you agree as well. And yeah. I, I, I always talk about that as something that, that actually helps you gain unity rather than, rather than yeah. uh, isolation. It's really kind of a counterintuitive thing because you'd think that if you just had to limit things to the fundamentals, you know, you would have this greater freedom to interact with the stuff, but the opposite happens. You see this in fundamentalism, right? They just, what you end up just retreating to those fundamentals and uh, making everything else cavalier and you never actually, you know, feel confident enough to venture out of those fundamentals uh, with anyone who, who might disagree with your cultural sort of, um, you know, angle. And so uh, it's interesting how it's, a, it's such an counterintuitive thing. You've got to study theology if you want to find unity, especially when it comes to church history or anything like this. Yes. The rule of, we find the same rule of faith when we read, don't we? For sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that's a good way to put it, for sure. Um, who's next? Me or you? 29. It's me. Okay. For un uncontrolled passion is a fierce and raging master to the servile reasoning tormenting it with pleasures as though they were scourges. Covetousness is another such master who provides no relief to the bondsman. But even if the one in bondage should slave in subservience to the commands of the master and acquire for him what he desires, the servant is always driven on to more, and all, <clears throat> and all the other things which are performed by evil are so many tyrants and masters. If someone should still serve them, even if he should happen to have passed through the water, according to my thinking, he has not at all touched the mystical water whose function is to destroy evil tyrants. And, and he's not hes not uh, talking about sinless perfectionism there. So that's actually quite an amazing statement, I think. Yeah. Because it's its going against the sacerdotal kind of, I don't know, just, 
you know, it's actually quite a solid view, you know? Yeah. Um, he's basically saying... He's recognizing that something happens with the water, but it's not automatic. Right, right. There's something that you've got to do in terms of your own repentance <laughs> and confession. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, at that level, amen, we're almost in exactly the same page, you know? Yeah. Um, that's great. All right, cool. Um, 256. Right, so <clears throat> yeah, so this, this next section is all about envy. And uh, I don't know if you, you felt the same. You know, if you ever preach the Ten Commandments and you preach on the doctrine of envy, there are certain things that everyone always says. And he says them all already. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So, and also, just that reminds me just on that previous point the, bun, the bond servant thing, you know, it's just great. It's just Romans 7, Romans, you know, uh, Romans 7, yeah. Roman 7, yeah, just basically just the law. Uh, sin, you know, it's coming straight out of just a, a general sense of uh, being in touch with, with what Paul talks about and the, the, the problem of sin. All right, so going on to envy then, um, 256. We still in chapter 2. We were in chapter 2, the book 2. Yeah. Yep. Uh, no longer does any offense which comes about through evil withstand the one who is in this manner, uh, who in this manner follows God. After these things, the envy, envy of his brothers arose against Moses. Envy is the pas passion which accuses evil, the father of death, the first entrance of sin, the root of wickedness, the birth of sorrow, the mother of misfortune. That sounds like an excellent death metal band. The mother <laughs> of misfortune. Uh, the mother of misfortune, the basis of disobedience, the beginning of shame. Every, uh, sorry, envy banished us from the paradise uh, having become a serpent. This was so interesting. Listen to this. Envy banished us from paradise, having become a serpent to oppose Eve. Interesting. I mean, at one level, it's like, so yeah. Envy was it. set against Eve, tempting her. I it's think almost, that's probably the idea. I know, but it almost sounds like he's a allegorizing to make it more palatable that, you know, actually the serpent was envy. And actually the whole thing is just the story. Let's talk about envy. <laughs> you know, and uh, not yeah. the non literal approach, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, I wonder, you know, anyway. So, envy banished us, blah, blah, blah. Um, envy walled us off from the tree of life, divested us of holy garments, and in shame led us away clothed with fig leaves. Again, like it could be this giant story to communicate envy, <laughs> but uh, it probably wasn't. So, anyway, but, um, I mean, a good theology of envy right there. I, mean, I totally, solid. totally, yeah, I'd agree with everything ultimately, as long as we're not denying the <laughs> historical reality that, yeah, yeah. Amen. that's exactly the root cause. Loved it. That's a great paragraph. Yep. Good. Carrying on then, 257. Envy armed Cain contrary to nature and instituted the death, which is vindicated seven times. Envy made Joseph a slave. Envy is the death-dealing sting, the hidden weapon, the sickness of nature, the bitter poison, the self-willed emaciation, the bitter, tar, the bitter dart, the nail of the soul, the fire in the heart, the flaming burning on the inside. The mother Beautiful. of misfortune. This, that's good. That makes for good preaching right there. It does make good preaching. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can just, you can hear, you can see him pounding that out and every, everyone's just going. <gasps> <gasps> the mother of misfortune. <laughs> mother. <laughs> um, all right. And then the last one, let's, let's just crack yeah. this out. Uh, for envy, it is not its own misfortune but another's good fortune that is unfortunate. Hmm. Wow. For envy, it is not its own misfortune, but another's good fortune that is unfortunate. Yeah. Wow. That's good. Again, inversely, success is not one's own good fortune, but the neighbor's misfortune. Yeah. Wow. Dude. That's a good, good way of putting, uh, describing envy. Hey? Yeah, wow. That's really amazing. Uh, envy is grieved at the good ends of men. And good takes deeds of men. Uh, sorry, good deeds. You know, I actually, I, I, needed, I needed this last week when I preached on Edom, or at least Obadiah, you know, dealing with the, the pride uh, yeah. of Edom and stuff. This, is, this would have been great. Envy is uh, grieved at the good deeds of men and uh, takes advantage of their misfortunes. Yeah. It is said that the vultures which devour corpses are destroyed by perfume. Are they? <laughs> Reminds me of some of the Puritan preachers. Yeah. They have like these weird references to biological facts which just aren't true. 
and everyone knows that the phoenix it's like the phoenixes aren't real right 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 totally yeah <laughs> man it's a uh, it's I was just reminded of a whole bunch of stuff in Augustine. Oh my goodness! In City of God, he's just going <laughs> on about this, this, you know, just illustration after illustration. Obviously, cutting edge medical stuff of the time, you know, and it's horrifying. I'm not even going to go into it now. Anyways, uh, their nature is akin to the foul and the corrupt. Anyone who is in the power of this sickness is destroyed by the happiness of his neighbors, as by the application of some perfume. So you're, you're the vulture, basically. But if he should see any unfortunate experience, he flies to it, sets his crooked beak to it, and draws forth the hidden misfortunes. Brilliant. Mm. I love that. That's the best par paragraph for me. And, but, but, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of what John Piper said. It's like, you, you know, envy, or he was talking about pride, but very, very similar. He was just saying, like, whether you're a child or whether you're a nation or whether you're a, an adult, we have all this thing, this, this one thing in common. When you're gripped in the, in the hold of pride, essentially, um, you will rejoice at someone's misfortune because it elevates your own insecurities. You know, it, it, at least it elevates, uh, it soothes your own insecurities and elevates yeah. your, your own delusions. Uh, exactly. Just so like, yeah, you, know, you just Our read. Our hearts are wicked. Exactly. Just that, that's the stuff that brings it out right there. Yeah. So, you know, that's excellent. And I mean, I was living that. That was that was vivid imagery, wasn't it? You know, draws oh. forth the hidden fortunes. I'm seeing him pulling out intestines with his hooked beak. You know, I'm so, like, yeah. Amen. It, may, it makes me want to read the rest of it, you know, and just go, yeah. I, I'm, I'm keen to find those insights and just use them. Yeah. And, and, and think Very effective it. communicator, excellent. spot on in terms of just nailing the, the essence of envy. Yeah. Um, although he may not be finding it in all the right places. Right, exactly. And at that level, you know, he's with the rest of everything we've read yeah. so far, isn't it? I mean, like basically very rarely, I mean, maybe Chris Oyston would be the only one who sort of hesitates to, to go there. But even he, yeah. uh, you know, will be uncomfortable with a lot of what he says. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I think that's just part and parcel of, of how it works until they really get their historical grammatical exegesis down. Um, but yeah, Gregory of Nyssa, important dude. Lots to think you about. You know who him. has no fluff? You know, if I, I'm reading John MacArthur as well as I'm reading through Luke. John MacArthur's the exact opposite of this. Oh, so true. Yeah. Just all fact, bro. It's just, there's just facts coming at you. No stories, no anecdotes, Nothing. sometimes some very pertinent quotes. Yeah. But, but none of the fluff, bro. None of it. Yeah. No, that guy can preach. I like it. I like yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like where, where we do overlap with, with MacArthur as well. Like, I don't know. He just, it's that Baptistic ethos, you know, um, yeah. it, it comes through, you know, it matters like obeying your government and, you know, church state stuff. And yeah, yeah. I just, yeah. Resonates strongly with all of that. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he, he, for me is a convictional preacher. Yeah. Piper is passionate. Mm -hmm. MacArthur is conviction. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. And that's it. Yeah. I love the way he, um, I was, they were doing the, I just by accident sort of hit on a, a YouTube video where he was, you know, he just, uh, they're obviously recording him in his office or something to give a little sermon, like during the lockdown. So he's sitting there and he's like, okay, so he's just got his little sermon manuscript notes thing. And he's like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to preach at you, you know, um, this isn't a sermon, but I will, I will just tell you a, little, a few things that I've come across in, in the Bible and uh, hopefully this blesses you. Um, it just rattles off some like, you know, stuff that just, you know, just really just so natural and so good from a preacher perspective. It's just great because yeah. I mean, and everyone else is struggling with the camera thing. It's almost like a non-issue for him. And then I look down and it's like something like 177,000 views or something, you know, <laughs> some like ridiculous <laughs> amount, just almost like he seems oblivious to it all. And he's just, he's just doing his thing. So that yeah. guy's a player for sure. Machine. Yeah. Anyway, so from Gregory of Nyssa to John McCon uh what's his name? <laughs> MacArthur. Uh, yeah. We've gone the whole way. Um, all right, good. Let's end it there. So this becomes listenable for people. Uh, yeah. And um, any any final thoughts? Go to church. Well, we can say that. Well, yeah, I was going to say, Mike, you know, uh, lockdowns is becoming out of lockdown. Right? We've been to church, but now you must go to church. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Next time we talk, we had, I will have done We that. had backbone. You guys didn't. Now it's your turn to go to church. <laughs> hey, you got venue. We don't have venue. I uh, know. Uh, yeah. You could have done it outside, bro. Uh. <laughs>
<laughs> Just joking. <laughs> Uh, stand on my car in the street oh my goodness anyways that's the topic on its own let's stop there thanks nick out cheers goodbye wait a minute wait a minute i'm playing my thing here